Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. I'm Charles Epting from HR Harmer in New York City. And I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Now, Michael, today's guest is somebody who, uh, anybody who's familiar with the APS stamp chats, Mm -hmm. probably knows who we're going to be talking to. Most definitely, yeah. And I was going to say, anybody who's joined their trivia or watched the Chatty Awards or seen their Mm -hmm. stamp stories uh, is probably familiar with with our guest. But I'm still really excited to have her on. Yeah, so Casey Jo White, I feel like she's done the the majority of – she probably holds the record for most stamp chats held. I think she, she has been one of the best at leveraging social media during mm-hmm. COVID. I feel yeah. like she's really been somebody who has – I feel like she's everywhere. I was going to say she's used social media, but but it also it, all of it feels important and interesting. It's mm-hmm. not like um, – it's not like she's just you know putting all this stuff out there. Like Everything she does – um, really feels like it contributes to the hobby. But it, it's and, not just social media. She's also writing articles for the AP. She's also writing articles for other publications. old school social media, though. Isn't yeah. that all an article? Is? <laughs> an article is just social media from like 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, no, it's that you see her name popping up. I know what she does with the Carriers and Local Society. Mm-hmm. Uh, on a personal level, I've been researching uh, this cover for the last couple of weeks. And when I hit a dead end, I sent her a scan, and then she comes at me with, like, <laughs> paragraphs and paragraphs of information. Um, yeah. I, I'm really excited to talk to Casey Joe White. I think this mm-hmm. is going to be uh, a, a really cool one. This was one yeah. I've been looking forward to. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, too. So without further ado, let's bring her in. Let's bring her in. Hello. Hello. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> it's going well. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thanks for uh, for joining us. Yeah, nice thanks for having me. Virtually meet you finally. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what have you guys been up to? This... Talking on Zoom and and being buried in in consignments on my end at least is mm-hmm. trying to trying to keep above water. Yeah. Hey, how about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I've been, um, you know, working on some stamp stuff. Yesterday, I just uploaded some more. Um, information about expresses to the carriers and locals society website um so the the collection that i work with the um the feral collection um i have been this past basically this past year i have been alternating between uh working on express labels and um state tax stamps and then every once in a while uh, a few little things here and there but that's what i've been primarily working on since uh, the last year and i am kind of been looking through lately looking through some of the collection to try to think of something else to work on i kind of want to work on um ryuku um Mm. stamps because there's a pretty big collection of that that hasn't been worked up yet so i have been starting some preliminary research into those and i'm kind of excited about it yeah well to to get us up to speed how did you get here how did you get to where you are now what's your philatelic journey and and uh, and then you know once you get us up to the present day if you could explain a little bit about the the feral collection and and your role with with uh organized making heads and tails of it (laughs) yeah so um so around when was it around 2000 12, 2011, uh, I started working for Mr. Farrell, um, Mike, and um, at that time, he had a beer can collection. So um, I was um, cataloging his beer can collection for him. And then he decided that, you know, he he wanted to make a a change. And he said, I want to go back to collecting stamps. So um, he got he sold the beer can collection and started um, building his stamp collection back. He at one time had a, a fairly large stamp collection um, and then had kind of sold that off uh, most of it. And now he then he wanted to, to get back into it. And so he said, you know, a lot of the stuff I collect is kind of back of the book stuff that they don't make album pages for. Mm. Um, and I even if they made album pages for it, I would want more 
of an extensive write-up. So he asked me to make some custom pages, album pages for him. And now I have just, I, I've made hundreds of <laughs> albums um, for his, his collection. And he collects um, U.S. and U.S. possessions. And like I said, a lot of back of the book um, match and medicine, tax stamps, um, a, a big collection of Christmas seals. Um, and so I help um, organize and write up and build albums for that collection. Um, some of my work you can see on the Carriers and Locals website. Um, and then I also um, put together exhibits, um, go to shows, um, watch auctions and kind of keep an eye out on on how things are going and i've been uh writing some articles for some philatelic um journals so um i've got articles in the american philatelist the carriers and local society um journal the penny post and the american revenuer wow. yeah i was gonna did, did you michael you go ahead i, I was gonna ask the the being kind of the curator of this collection. So you keep an eye on the auctions and prices. Are you buying material for the collection uh, um, itself or? Sometimes um, he and I will sit down and like look through a catalog, an auction catalog and kind of um, say, hey, do we, do we need this? Does this fill any gaps? And we'll kind of talk about it together. And I have bid on things for him, but that's only when he requests that mm -hmm. I do that. I, I let him take care of the buying. Um, sometimes when I go to stamp shows, um, I will, you know, sit down with dealers and flip through their, their boxes. Um, and if I see something that I think, oh, that, that would go great because we have something related to it. Um, I'll bring him over to, to assess it and, and I'll, I'll suggest these things. Um, so it, it's a lot of fun for me. I like, um, it's great when you find something that on its own wouldn't be super exciting, but then when you put it next to another thing you have, like it's that connection and it just, it fits. So w w when, when Mike came to you and said the beer cans are going and the stamps are coming in, mm -hmm. what was your reaction to that? And at what point did you, because you, you've, you've taken the reins. A lot of people would, I feel like, treat this like a, like a job and just go through the motions and you can create album pages without embracing the hobby. But you have obviously run with this and really made it your own. So what was your initial reaction when he told you about this change? And at what point did you say, I want this to be my thing as well? Okay, so um, I had been working on the beer kids and I was actually in the middle of working on the, I was putting things on his website. Um, and he called me and said, I'm, I've sold the whole collection. And I was just sitting there like, because <laughs> I, I hadn't, hadn't heard anything about this. And I was like, do you want me to keep working? Like, I, I don't know. And he's like, well, we'll figure it out. And it was, um, it was actually, I, I did other work for him for a few months before he decided to hop back into the stamp collecting. So, and, you know, I... I just fell in love with it. Um, and he's been a great mentor to me. Um, I can't thank him enough for the opportunity to get into this. Um, you know, I went to college I'm as an English major. Um, English and journalism were what I studied. And, um, you know, it's kind of hard as a writer to find uh, a niche, you know, today. Um, you know, that you'd, you'd think that there's so many outlets that you would be able to, but it's, it is really hard to break in. And this gave me something that I could research and really delve into and write about. And I've just had so much fun with it. Yeah, the, the research and, and writing was kind of what I wanted to talk about a, a, a little. You had, I'd seen most recently, you published in, in the AP an article on the Trans-Mississippi issue. Oh, yeah. Um, I love the Trans-Mississippi <laughs> issue. Um, oh, my gosh, I could talk about it all day. <laughs> um, Mike actually um, spoke with uh, a Bill Dugan. Um, he is a doctor here in Indiana, and he 
it's this this great collection and um through his connection with mike um we we got it together and i started doing work on that for him and um i you know i started with the neil rosenthal book and you know i, I absorbed that and then i started doing my own research um i looked into do you know i don't mean to interrupt do you know randy at all i've met him at a stamp show He's but a character. Oh, he's he, a, he's he really an, is. He's an entertaining guy, but that's a great book that he that he put together. That's... Oh, absolutely. Um, and so, so like, I, I just absorbed everything I could, and I would eventually like to publish my own book on the Trans Mississippi. Um, uh, but uh, that might be in the future. Um, one of my my main interests with it was why were these images chosen? and what images weren't chosen because mm. um, this was the first uh commemorative issue uh published printed by the bureau of engraving and printing um so the second commemorative issue in the u.s um the first by the bureau of engraving and printing and you know why why did they they choose these images why were these images important and then on top of that um, they were made in such a short time period. They had to go through such a huge change. You know, they went from, they were supposed to be two colors, became one color. Um, they went through all these changes, all these rearranging. And it is kind of like they came out later than they were supposed to, but it's kind of amazing. They came out of all <laughs> considering everything that was going on at that time. Um, and it's just there's so much behind the scenes stuff that you can find nowadays because you have access online to like um, museums in Omaha that I like wouldn't be able to, you know, just go and visit every day. But um, I actually have visited some of those, you know, the, the stamp show in 2019 was in Omaha. So I was able to go <laughs> there and check out some of that um, firsthand. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great um, stamp issue. And I gave a, t a stamp chat on that issue, um, which I think was pretty well received. Um, that's just about the art of it. And I don't know, it's one of my favorite issues. <laughs> when you compare, you know, a, 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 an issue like that, a lot of people have at least the lower values in their album. And, and a lot of people have a, an awareness of the Trans-Mississippi issue. How does that compare and contrast to working on something like state revenues or we were emailing recently about an S. Allen Taylor forgery, the more esoteric stuff, the carriers and locals, the match in medicine, that there's maybe not as much awareness of. Um, you know, do, do you find yourself being able to educate people more when it comes to a, a real obscurity versus the, the Trans-Mississippi issue, for example? I'm going to have to think about this one. <laughs> uh, I definitely think that you know, with the carriers and locals, not everyone's aware of them. So I can sit down and be like, well, this is how the the postal system has changed. And I, I have like a broader topic to um, kind of pull information from. Um, whereas with the Trans-Mississippi, you know, people might be familiar with it, but there are still things that I could put my own unique perspective on. Um, because everybody has a different perspective. Everybody sees something different. Um, and what is valuable to one person isn't always valuable to someone else. Um, you know, someone, you might have like the rarest stamp, you know, like only one of a kind. Um, but if, if no one cares about it, but you yeah. like, you know, so um, I'm sorry, I'm not really answering your question very well. No, you, ab <laughs> you absolutely are. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely. It it's it's about creating interest in other people mm -hmm. as well. And, and and I think that the best way to create interest in other people is to be interested yourself. Yeah. Um people I've found are just attracted to when you have passion for something, even if it's not something that they get, you know, they they get that you get it. Mm -hmm. Um for example, I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> But I have a friend who will talk and talk about cars and I'm just like, uh, okay, I, I guess I see. Yeah. But like, <laughs> it's, I, I enjoy listening to them be excited about cars. Um, even if myself, I, I don't understand. It's, it's all a car to me. 
Can, can I explain why I got distracted for a second? Alex Hyman just texted us. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I and I took a picture of the screen and I said, "Alex, you're interrupting our episode." <laughs> and then he texted back, "Say hi to Casey for me." So Alex says hi to you. Oh, hi, Alex. <laughs> so if we leave this in the episode, then Alex can watch it and know that I actually did say hi to you. Uh, okay. If we have. Um, no, I, I agree though that the the passion is contagious. And and again, I'm not a car guy, but yeah, you get wrapped up in somebody's. Um, somebody's excitement and i think you've been really good at that and and sort of leveraging that with social media and with stamp chats and with the support of the aps i think you've really um you know taken a hold of of that part of the hobby a lot of people are very um uh, insular in their knowledge and Mm. their passion and you've been very uh giving with your with your um, interest in in all the most aps stamp chats really right three or four I've, and then you've I done a couple so, yeah. trivia nights i'm not sure anybody else is even in uh in, in the multiples yet <laughs> well and, and yeah. there's there's still some that i would like to do um you know i and i i've been a bit busy lately but i'd like to get a hold of heidi because some other things i would like to do i'd like to do another trivia night um mm-hmm. and i would like to do one on postage due stamps mm. um because I've already I've made an exhibit on those, and I think I could take that material and make it into a stamp chat. Especially because um, there are a lot of people who who want to study postage dues, and because I've done so much studying, I would like to help introduce people to how I do my research on those, and that way they can kind of use that to do their own research. I feel like there's a lot of awareness of postage dues, obviously, but not a lot of understanding, maybe. There's a lot of nuance that, that gets missed on people. People yeah. try and fill in the gaps in their albums, but they don't understand the uh, the ins and outs of, of what actually went into their usage. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go on to some stamp forums and I'll, I'll see people be like, why was this due? Um, it should be paying the correct rate or like... And sometimes you you just don't know because you weren't there. Like it could have been an overweight letter, but the letter's not in it anymore. So we mm. we just don't know. Um, and then there there are just some really weird little bits, especially with um. I found when I was studying postage dues, um, that the conversion in currency for international mails it's not as easy as just going and looking it up, right? Because back then the conversion was different. So I actually went on to um, Hathi Trust, uh, which is a great archive online. And I would find almanacs for that year. And usually in those almanacs, they'll have a currency conversion. So then I knew the currency conversion for that specific year. (laughs) And I could kind of do a little bit of that so that I could find out oh, you know, it, it seems like this would have been the same amount, but because of the conversion at that time, it was underpaid. So, <laughs> um, so like, those are things that I would, I would like to be able to help people with um, so that they can do their own research and really understand postage dues because they're an interesting thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so obviously the research and, and, exhibiting as well as part of your job description here but at what point do you kind of get to take the reins and say i want to you you had mentioned earlier studying ryuku islands Mm -hmm. choose what you want to do next a lot of times you know mike will give me a lot of free reign and say you know like these are some things that i want done but you know he's got so much material he's like i just want it all done (laughs) so you know i i can kind of pick and choose what area I'm going to work on. And sometimes that's, um, I choose because like, it's easy to do. Um, state revenues, I have, I've been working on those because you can just kind of sit down and and make some pages and kind of get through it. There's not a whole lot you can say about a tax stamp other than it paid this tax. Um, if it's just a stamp on its own, like if it's on a, a piece, obviously you could say a little more, but, um, so that's been something that I've been working on. Whereas the express labels, uh, they take a little more time because I'm researching these companies and saying, where did this company come from? And sometimes I find stuff and sometimes I don't um, because, you know, there, there's always room to add more research on. 
um, I was so excited in the uh, February issue of the American Philatelist, uh, Wayne Youngblood wrote a article about Acker's City Delivery. And um, he mentioned that, you know, my, my research on the Carriers and Locals website, he used that to build onto his research. And it's oh, wow. just so exciting to know that, you know, you put something out there and then somebody else can build on it and we can all work together to kind of put this puzzle together. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I don't have everything accessible to me, but if I put out what I've found and somebody else has access to something else and we can all work together, like it's uncovering a mystery of the past. And it's really um, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So this might be a bit of a tough question, but what happens when you hit a dead end? What happens? Do you take a step back and, and take a week or two and then reevaluate and come back at a different angle? Or what, what happens when you almost run out of research resources yeah and that that happens um a lot of times i'll put down this is what i i do know um mm -hmm. sometimes not very often because i i really don't it's that uh it's that journalism training of mine i don't want to put down anything that isn't that i can't back up mm -hmm. you know <laughs> so i'll put um uh, like believe that it's blah, blah, blah because of blah, blah, blah. Um, but not certain. I'm not, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And then I'll, I'll make the album page for it. And I, I have come back and usually it's, it's more than a week. Usually it's like a year. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll put it aside and I'll come back later and, and try again. But, uh, who knows? Like sometimes yeah. there's just a lot of stuff that's, that's lost. Yeah. I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about your creative side because you have uh, also um, uh, gotten into that side of the hobby. The I would say the more artistic side of the hobby, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think there's echoes of that when you talk about the the Trans Mississippi issue and and visually what draws you to those stamps. So can you talk a little bit about what you've done yourself uh, to to make pretty things that go through the mail? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I I you know when I started this job I didn't really know a whole lot about stamp collecting. Um, I knew about stamps and I knew about letter writing, but I didn't really know a whole lot about stamp collecting. And one of the things that I discovered was um, first day covers. And I was just so excited to see um, the idea of these caches where people, you know, they put their own twist on it, a stamp. And I wanted to make them so the first first day ceremony I went to, I convinced Mike to um, take me with him to um, Atlanta to um, the botanical art issue. Because uh, I, I looked at those and I was like, they're really pretty. I, I want them. And so that was my first first day ceremony that I went to. And I did a, a small amount of first day covers for that. And then I have been trying to, like, if I go to a ceremony, and I, I do enjoy going to first day ceremonies, um, I, I want to have covers to make. So I, I don't make them for every issue, but I do enjoy making them. Um, just last Tuesday, I went to the uh, uh, first day of the uh, Garden Beauty stamps um because it was in indiana it was in bloomfield indiana so it wasn't too far for me to travel um they didn't have a ceremony it was just go to the post office and they handed <laughs> us the the postage stamps uh um, and the the hand stamps uh but that was a lot of fun and for my my first day cover of that i drew um some girls in that are roller skating while they're holding a bouquet it's a silhouette of a woman roller skating and holding a bouquet and I've done three different first day caches that involve roller skating because roller skating is another hobby of mine that I really enjoy um I had gone to the American Topical Society and I I paid because they'll make you a list of every stamp on a topic if you mm. you pay a certain amount and I said I want to know all of the stamps that have roller skates on them and it was just this tiny page 
<laughs> it was so small. <laughs> and, like there's not a whole lot. And I'm like, if someday I want to make an exhibit on roller skating, because that's something I enjoy, I need more content. And so I can make that content. I can make, I can relate these things to roller skating somehow and draw that and then make content for it. And I think that's one of the great things about first day caches and collecting first day covers is that you get to add your own twist to the art that exists. And, you know, I, I look at that art that is going to be on the stamps and I, I see how it inspires me. And again, it's, it's that connecting thing, you know, like with research, with art, um, everybody adds another layer and it's, it's really about connecting people and mm communicating with other people and sharing ideas and that's just so exciting to me yeah yeah well speaking a bit about the the creative side in your local post which stamp chat which you won the the chatty for you talked a little bit about this creation that you'd made it was the what was it called the, the piggyback the piggyback post, post. piggyback yeah. post where you you created your own route and can you talk a little bit about that and what kind of gave you the idea to do that um, well, and share it with people. Yeah. So I, you know, I've been working on local posts, researching them for a long time. Um, but, and I had always kind of wanted to make my own um, because there are all of these kind of loopholes in the post a lot. And a lot of, like I mentioned in the stamp chat, I'm one person, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, 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 the postal authorities aren't going to come for me but even if they did like here's the the postal regulations here's how you can get around them and like if you, you have your legal this... team ready right to fight the, <laughs> to fight the my feds. legal team of, of me in case <laughs> <laughs> but no I, I i looked into it and it, it's something that you can do and there are people who um, besides me that do it there's a whole um uh carriers like I, I work with the carriers and local society which is mostly the the classic period of carriers and locals but there is a um a modern local post society what's it called um oh, wow. the local post collectors society and they do modern um like they they're just people who get together and they make their own local posts and they have their own journal so that you can order local post stuff from other people and um, I, I really wanted to do it. So I, um, I used what I knew about local posts and I, I designed my own local post stamp. Um, it's called the piggyback post because one, I like pigs um, <laughs> and there's not a whole lot of pigs on stamps um, that aren't Chinese New Year right, or Lunar yeah. New Year. Um, so I wanted to have a pig and I, I kind of looked at some of the um, modern post shapes. Usually a, like there's a lot of triangle local post stamps because a triangle is typically very different from a regular and it won't get confused. Um, and I used like some of the swirly elements, like a really simple, like as if it had been um, a wood block or typographed because a lot of classic local posts were typographed or very simply engraved. And I kind of I use that as inspiration to, to make my stamp. Um, and I, I made a post box. Um, I actually sewed it together um, with my sewing machine um, to make a, a backpack so that I, I set it up at the art gallery where I volunteer and people could put their cards in and I could pick it up and put it on my back and walk down the street to the post office. So um, that was a lot of fun for me. And uh, I was really excited because it was also a fundraiser for the art gallery and uh, got about $150, um, which was enough to make some repairs that are were needed um, to the, the building that it's in. So that was really nice. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating that's a it's great, amazing yeah that was really uh, uh when you're surrounded by this stuff 
all day, it must be very tempting to be like, I because a lot because a lot of these local posts were so fly by night and so, um, you know, uh, operated below the radar. It's probably easy to be like, I'm going to do what they did just 150 years later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, and there's there's so many great stories with local posts, especially like um, there were some local posts where the people just they set up this local post and said, oh yeah, we're, we're a local post. We're going to deliver your mail, buy our stamps. And then after they'd sold so many stamps, they just took off, <laughs> went to a different city. Like, um, you know, the, the people who bought the stamps couldn't use them and there was oh, no one to, to stop them because right. like, there's no regulation of that. Yeah. There was no regulation <laughs> on it. So there's, there's all sorts of wild stories with the, uh, local posts that are that make it really fun to research mm-hmm. and to think that you can do it yourself and you know what would you get away with if you could <laughs> so to, to tie it kind of back around you mentioned research again when when you're going to research these these items or these new topics where is the first place you're going really you said uh, Wayne Youngblood had mentioned that his research of an item had kind of if I can use your term, mm-hmm. piggybacked on top of your research of an item. Where did you find the research for that item that these other philatelists maybe hadn't seen before? I, I understand there's just so much information. No one can know everything. Mm-hmm. But um, but where, where do you look compared to where you think other people might not? Well, the first place I look for carriers and locals is the Carriers and Locals Society. Um, <laughs> they, the, their journal, The Penny Post, has a lot of um, information that you can you can actually search back issues on the Penny Post website, and so I start there. I kind of get an idea that gets me my base, so I know like where the post was located and and stuff. And then I will usually search newspaper archives and old directories, and I find that um, archive.org. Um, is a website that digitally archives a bunch of stuff from different libraries. So if I can try to find, and also Google Books is good for finding old directories. Um, I try to find directories of the time period in that city. That way I can search for those names, or if I can't find those names, for those street addresses, if they I have a street address. And I, I try to like tie things together, like in a big web because you might find that, um, you know, somebody is located at the address and, but their, their name isn't associated with this post, but the, you know, express at this address. And so then you can take that name and now you search for that name. Um, you, you might look through census records or something through ancestry.com and you, you find more and you just kind of connect it. And that's how, like a lot of these express companies were connected to each other. They transferred on each other's lines. So you can kind of find connections with that. I also search auction catalogs um, because a lot of um, auction companies keep their um, history online and you can search old catalogs. And also we have a, a philatelic library at the Feral Collection and it has a bunch of auction catalogs. So I can look through those because you might find a cover with that stamp and then that cover has an address and has more information that you can use to pull and search that and until i I keep going until either (laughs) i hit a dead end or i have spent too much time and i need to (laughs) move on to the next thing Mm -hmm. so writing and and doing all this research is this kind of a a passion project that's on the side of your actual position there or are you asked to do this writing and submitting the publications uh articles to publications as well a little bit of both Mm -hmm. um there are some things where you know a, a publication might ask like we need more more writing and mike will say yeah go ahead and and write something for them um and then there's some that i I do on my own the uh the my most recent american philatelist 
article was about Christmas seals and charity stamps. And that is, I had already written about sanitary fair stamps and Christmas seals for Mike's collection, making those albums. Mm -hmm. And then I just took that knowledge and on my own reassessed it into an article that I wanted to write. So it's a little bit of both. Um, Part of it is just taking, is me on my own making something out of what I've made for Mike. And some of it is Mike asking, hey, or saying, hey, you know, this would be interesting. I think people would like to know about it. And I would like to be the one to, you know, uh, be be the patron that gets it out there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and sort of going off of off of that and, and um, you know, you mentioned earlier the the eventual goal of a, a 1898 transmits book what are your goals moving forward and, and once we can all get back to shows and and, and meet in person what, you know are, 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 I, I would hope and expect that after your uh, stamp chats you will become a part of the speaker circuit at stamp shows uh for for a long time to come i i know i'll be there whenever you <laughs> give a talk at the show that i'm at so what, what are your goals moving forward what you know what 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 projects are on the horizon in addition to again the, the transmits and the reuse and things like that where do you want to go from here Oh, um, well, or are you just excited to see what, what comes, what, what, uh, <laughs> you know, where, where the journey takes you? Cause I, I, well, one I thing is I I've worked on exhibits for Mike and for Dr. Dugan. And what I would like to do is make one of my own exhibits. I did make a digital exhibit for the virtual stamp show on games but I, I would like to make a more detailed exhibit and I have a couple ideas in my mind. And once I've got that exhibit and I have gotten at least a Vermeil or higher, I would like to start working toward becoming a philatelic judge um, and going to stamp shows and being able to appreciate material outside of the collection I work with. Um, not that I can't do that anyway, but I, I really, I really like exhibiting and I really want to be part of the, I, I think as a judge, not only will I get to be part of that, but I can maybe use that position to inspire more people to enter exhibits because I think it's a really exciting part of philately is exhibiting. So that's one thing I would really like to work on and I am in the process of working on. So. That's, that's great. Yeah. I mean, there's, it, you've, you've done a lot for, especially with, with all this social media and everything going on, you've done a lot or I've seen your name kind of everywhere uh, lately, as far as being promoted by the APS, the, the things, the publications in the AP and everything like that. So obviously you'd want to continue your writing for the AP. Do you Mm -hmm. plan on doing any research or any, I know you probably have your hands full, but do you have plan on it doing anything outside of the collections that you're working on as far as publications or research? Um, yeah, it's just trying to to think of what it is. A lot of times I, you know, I'll ask people like, what are you interested in? What would you like to hear? And, um, what would you like to know more about? And I would be happy to do that research and stuff, but um, because I I would like, but I want, I want to write things that people will read. Um, So I I often reach out on that. Um, Obviously your, your degree is is in journalism really aids with the whole research and and writing portion. I mean, it's, it's kind of a dream come true position for a philatelist. Yeah. Um, it, it really is, you know, uh, I did some work as a, um, on doing local news for a radio station and that was a lot of fun. Um, but it was a very small local news radio station. Um, so it didn't pay enough for me to keep working on that. Um, but I really liked going out and talking to people and informing people of what was going on, you know, like this is the change that's happening in the city. Um, that was that was really exciting, and I, I like 
writing and I like reaching out to people and I like speaking, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I've given a few talks at uh, stamp shows. So I, I just, I'm very fortunate, I think, to have the position I do and to have, you know, Mike being such a great mentor and leading me into this hobby where I feel like I have a place and I want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I couldn't ask for more. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's so great to hear. I love the enthusiasm. I think a lot of people, um, uh, you know, maybe don't wear their collecting on their sleeve as much or maybe, I don't know. I feel like there's in, in certain ways, a stigma around stamp collecting, but talking to you just, I, I don't know. For me, at least it's, it's infectious and uh, reminds me why we all got into it in the first place. And I, again, whenever your name pops up in a stamp chat or something, I know it's going to be, um, just a, a wonderful cheerleader for the hobby. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I am also a member of the um, the APS membership committee. So, um, you know, I've been trying to think of ways to bring people into the APS. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a member of the Carriers and Local Society, of the Classic Society, of the American First State Cover Society, um, and the American Topical Association. So, mm -hmm. um, and that, that actually makes me think one, uh, article I would like to write for maybe the, um, first day cover society is different ways you can display your first day covers. Um, because, you know, one thing that I do with some of mine is I frame them. Um, and I'll, I, I like a, what a lot of people are doing artistically with, you know, framing envelopes or stamps in, you know, just arranging them in a certain way or, or cutting or cutting around a stencil and putting that over stamps um, and using stamps, not just as their own art, but making them into art. Um, so I, I would definitely like to to maybe write something about that. Although I think that's a topic that's been covered a lot, but I think I could bring my own perspective to it too. Mm -hmm. So, can I can I ask this? This might be a bit of a strange question, but so you're a member of the First Day Cover Society. So, do you see any? We we all know the kind of, if you will, famous cachet makers: mm -hmm. uh, Crosby, Collins, you know, Melissa Fox. The, a lot of the people who hand painted covers as well that obviously not Crosby, but, um, mm -hmm. do you see any people kind of making cachets currently that may be held in the same regard, uh, many years down the line as, as we hold them? I mean, their, their first day covers when you come across them are, are still so collectible and still so valuable mm -hmm. to people. Okay. So, uh, first, uh, I, Mad props to Danny. Um, Danny was a, uh, a young philatelic um, the YP oh, yep. <laughs> member. Um, she's a graduate and she makes wonderful covers. And I would not be surprised if her covers um, were collectible in the future because they, she brings an interesting perspective to it. And I, I really like what she does. Um, and then another one would be and I can't remember, I'm so bad with names. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but he gave a, a stamp chat about painting cachets um, and did some beautiful watercolor. Um, his work is is lovely. And I can definitely see that in the future uh, being something worth collecting. Um, so those are, are are the ones I would look out for. That's uh, great to know. Yeah, I, I know that the there doesn't happen often, but when it happens, that they, they just become so collectible to the people who like first day covers that, that mm -hmm. it's just they never really go away. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one thing that I I kind of enjoy is when I go to stamp shows. You know, I I work with the Feral Collection, so that gives me access to a lot of the more expensive stuff. But I myself, for my personal collection, I I don't have a, a ton of money to spend. So one of my favorite things to do at stamp shows is just sit at the dollar box section. And I think it's so fascinating to flip through those dollar boxes. And sometimes you will find a hand painted cachet and it's not the most beautiful artwork. Like mm -hmm. it might've been done by a, someone in their teens or something. Um, or, you know, even it, it looks like a, a crayon drawing or something. And I, 
I love buying them, you know, yeah. just spending a dollar to buy this, like, cause somebody at some point put time and effort into this and it's no, it's not going to be super collectible, but it's like holding, you know, it, it's, it's different than just going to the store and buying a print of something like this is something that somebody put their, their heart into, even if it's just a small thing. And owning that makes me feel good like I feel like I have a connection to whoever it was and even if I can't find out who it was Mm. so I first day cover collecting is is interesting to me because there's that really personal aspect to it even if it's not necessarily collectible or valuable yeah I totally agree so I, I just my final question would would be what probably was or held in your regard as the most interesting piece of information you found in all of your research. Oh my gosh! Tough one, Michael. <laughs> I saved the uh, most difficult one for last. I I find forgery is really interesting. Um, there's a lot of fascinating stories um, about forgers because, and, and then there's this whole other level to it where you have these people who, you know, there's the art of the stamp itself and then these people who make their own version of it, like a cover of a song. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I think learning about uh, Desperati is fascinating. And I also like um, JB Moons um, was a, a cataloger, one of the one of the first stamp catalogers and album makers. And uh, in 2019, I went to Belgium and I found the building where his store was at. And I went to to look at it and it's an art gallery now um but i i took a picture in front of it and then i i talked to some of the the stores nearby and they said that uh um one of his like ancestors great grandkids or something had come by to look at it too they're like oh you're not the first person to come to <laughs> this this place for so yeah um it it's so interesting to research the people behind stamps i think i hope that's a good answer it's really <laughs> hard to think of gosh yeah. my favorite um, yeah, you, you can't put people on the spot michael <laughs> <It was laughs> yeah no but that that is i completely agree the people behind the behind the stamps are are almost sometimes as important as the stamps themselves and the forgers that are famous it, it's fascinating to see people actually trying to buy the forgeries with the from the actual forgers for mm-hmm. for actual money, not the same as the stamp, but but actual uh, actual money. So that yeah, that stuff was always super fascinating. I'm gonna go look for something really quick. So okay. oh, I'm just gonna yeah. step away for like thirty seconds. <laughs> okay, not a problem. I'm trying to think. I I wish I had more of a focus to talk about, but I I know my brain is everywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> no, 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 that's that. I mean, I really do that. I I saw the local post. Uh, one live. I was there. I like that mm-hmm. one a lot. I I haven't gotten to see any of your, your trivia ones. Are those up on YouTube still? Oh, or my my trivia night was just live. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, both of the trivia nights I did were both live. Um, and I think it's because like there was a lot of audience interaction, and yeah. it's hard to get you know, you know, for privacy reasons to get approval from everyone. Is yeah, it okay to put yeah. this up? Um, I would definitely like to do another trivia night, and I've already got things in my mind for how that's going to go <laughs> um lately i've been watching like i, I love trivia mm-hmm. love trivia and games um one of the things that i've been watching a lot with my friends is this uh british show um only connect mm-hmm. um and i think that would make a, a fun thing you know have a sequence of stamps and like what is the same about them all yeah. um that'd be a good thing to add into a trivia night um and then, you know, I've, I'm, I mean, you talked about things that I've, I've been working on. 
Uh, one thing that I've been working on and very, very slowly because it's definitely a my passion project thing. And so I do it when I have time on the side, but I am trying to make my own stamp game. Um, oh, wow. So hopefully, you know, maybe by the summer I'll have it actually done. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I kind of was inspired um, by trading card games. And I was like, well, let's make a stamp trading card game. And so I came up with a way to, like, I, I've made a template for you would print it out and then you'd mount your stamp on the card and then, like, put it in a card sleeve to protect mm -hmm. it. And then I've, I've found, come up with a way to make stats for each stamp so that you could use them in the game. So <laughs> I, I still need to play test it. Mm -hmm. And then I might publish that. Um, Are the stamps as... provided or do you have to go out and buy actual stamps? No, you would use stamps in your collection and you would just. Okay. That's a really cool idea. <laughs> that um, I've, I've made a template that you would print out and then you could either fill it in on the computer or you fill it in by hand, you know, mm -hmm. whatever is easiest for you. Um, and you would print that out and you'd have the cards and then you mount the, your stamp from your collection yeah. on the card. Um, put it in like a card sleeve and then that's just you know like an alternate way to store your stamps mm -hmm. besides just putting them in an album you could have them in like a, a card deck box um and just like take <laughs> them somewhere and someone's like oh you collect stamps and you could be like oh here's my little deck box and let me show you um these the stamp has this many points so mm -hmm. i i think that would be really fun and i i really hope that I can get some play testing done on that um, with my family. They like to play games with me. Um, Michael and I can play over uh, yeah. an episode. Of, what, what, once it's all finished, we'll, we can play like live. Oh, that'd yeah. be great. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. That'd be fun. What, what I was grabbing that I was going to show you guys really quick. I love how much this hobby has changed over the last 160 years. So this is an English translation mm -hmm. well. of, I have heard his name pronounced about 2 million different ways. <laughs> Um, yeah, this um, is... I I've been saying moons because moons. my my husband's Belgian, so he okay. says that moons. he thinks that the the Belgian way, if he was from the the Brussels region, it would probably be moons. So that's how I. I'm gonna go. With, I'm gonna go with moons. So this is on the falsification of postage stamps or a general nomenclature of all the imitations and forgeries. Mm -hmm. The best part is that there are no images. <laughs> so it verbally describes yeah every forgery. Mm -hmm. which is totally useful when you're dealing with, uh, you know, uh, exa Italian states yeah. and you have to read what the imitations look like mm -hmm. versus the general stamps. This is a, a, a very useful catalog. Well, it's Moon's got such a bad rap because he he made these catalogs and he put illustrations in to help people. And then what people did was they took his illustrations yeah. and they made forgeries based on his illustrations. So it's probably so. for the best that there's no illustrations <laughs> in here. I also th th this has been the latest thing to fascinate me. The fact that there is the Confederate States of America mm -hmm. in 1862 when there was still a Confederate state like. Mm -hmm. The Civil War was just starting, <laughs> and he's already identifying forgeries of Confederate stamps. Mm -hmm. uh, is amazing to me that people were that, that opportunistic. Yeah. Exactly, they were, they were like, "Oh, there's a Civil War. Let's make fake stamps of the new country." Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and it was it was actually a prime time to do it because if they got caught, you know, the the Union's not going to get them in trouble for making fake Confederate stamps. True. Mm -hmm. Doesn't True. doesn't hurt them. <laughs> So, so yeah, like, it, I, was, I, I, it was perfect for them. I just love the concept of this catalog with no pictures mm -hmm. describing <laughs> forgeries. So we have a big literature collection in that I've been trying to find any free time to go through, which hasn't been successful. But <laughs> Yeah, you know, at one point, Mike told me, um, was talking to me and he's like, I don't think that there's any other hobby where there's so much material research um, mm -hmm. that you can go back on. And you know, I'd be hard pressed to think of one. Um, oh, compared the, the to only, coins or something, it's yeah, yeah. It's it's so just, much deeper. The only other thing I could think of, and and we had an argument over it because <laughs> was um, I said that maybe you know in modern days, one 
a, a thing that people really like is speed running video games. And I'm like, you can go online and you could find like people cataloging glitches in a game that's like you have to be on this tile and mm-hmm. turn around three times. And I'm like, people like really dig into that. And there's so many people doing it. You could probably find a lot of information on that. And then he was like, well, that's not really, that doesn't really count. <laughs> so we had an idea about this... whether that counted or not. But <laughs> I doubt that'll have the staying power that Philately has. <laughs> if Philately has lasted this long. And, you know, yeah. it's one of those things that uh, you hear people like, oh, it's it's dying. But then you like look at uh uh, magazine stamp magazines from like a hundred years ago and they're like it's dying <laughs> it'll <Yeah>. be dead <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hasn't died <laughs> so yeah exactly exactly it, the, the, the photos that you see at uh stamp shows now that they take it look almost identical to the mm-hmm. photos that you know, the, the, if anything they're more younger attendants mm-hmm. younger people attending us three us three <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us thanks for doing this this yeah. has been Fantastic. Contact Thank me you. anytime you have like a lag and you need someone else to talk to because yeah. I love to talk. <laughs> yeah. And and we should do my keep talking to Michael about doing things live in person someday. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this would be a fun round table at a stamp show if the three yeah. of us sat down in person and just oh, talked yeah. about what going to a stamp show is like or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and the you're on the membership committee for the APS. I'd love to talk mm-hmm. to you more about the you know, the ideas that you guys have and what you're what you're doing because I mm-hmm. In the latest AP, I felt like there were a ton of new applicants. There were a ton of new APS members. And um, shout out to the, the North Toronto Stamp Club, which just joined. Um, the I haven't gotten have been... my AP yet. I'm still waiting. Oh, okay, I read it online now. <laughs> I, I, I know wait. I should. I know. I know I should. I know I should get with the times. And was your cat walking around earlier? Yes. Um, I had hoped I... so. <laughs> yeah, I was I was kind of hoping you'd like introduce us to the cat. Oh, I I could. I'd have to go and get them all. Right now, the no, only one in the how, room is how, how many? How many do you have? I have four. Oh, wow. Um, I have so Orion, Pandora, Freya, and Mystery. She's. I'm a cat. I'm a cat person, and I don't have a cat, so that's why I'm I'm going through like cat withdrawals during COVID. Oh. My so... mother joined the Cats on Stamp study group. Really? That is such a great group um, they're on th- their publication their publication is amazing okay their publication is better than like most serious <laughs> societies i feel the cats on stamp study group magazine is like they do interviews with all the designers they do like if, if the ukraine does a new cat stamp they track down the designer and <laughs> interview them and i'm like like the cats on stamps people are killing it i feel Oh, they are so good, and um, they like catalog every time a cat is on a stamp. Like, if if it doesn't have to be a cat stamp, if a cat is in the background, like on a pillow, yeah, or it'll, it'll be like a like a British coat of arms with like a lion in the mm-hmm. corner. And I'm like, is that? And they they're like, that's a cat. That's a cat. Um, yeah, I got my mother to sign up for that group, and she has now renewed her membership. Like, I thought it would just be fun because mm-hmm. she loves cats, and she was buying you know cat first day covers. She's renewed for like two years now. <laughs> And she's like, I'm going to write an article for them. And I'm like, Mom, you're like really into this. That's yeah, awesome. Stamps thing now. They are a great Dedicated. community. And if, if you talk to them at stamp shows, if they have They're a booth awesome. at stamp shows, they are so much fun. They're, oh no, again, <laughs> like with the cats, I feel like a lot of the, again, more serious organizations could learn from something as silly as the cats on stamps group because mm-hmm. they're like the real deal. They're awesome. Mm hmm. Um, so it's I the, love it's the passion. It's the passion yeah. behind it. It's yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I signed up for my mom the first time and they're like giving me all these free covers and like cat Cinderella's and all sorts of stuff. Cat and I was Cinderella's, like, you people, I love that. yeah, I was like, you people get it. You understand <laughs> yeah. what this hobby is about. Cat so, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> I have, a, I bought my mom a, a sheet of imperforate French Antarctic stamps with a cat on them, mm-hmm. yeah. which is like the most expensive cat stamp in her collection. <laughs> and she, to her, it may as well be like a cheap Polish or Romanian. <laughs> she couldn't care less that this is like actually a rare item. Yeah. To her, it's just like cats are cute. Well, that's why like, <laughs> you know, you, a thing only has value if you want it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone is the curator of their own collection. Oh. And mm-hmm. if, if it's valuable to you, then that's what matters. Yeah. Um, one of the, the funny, oh, <laughs> beautiful our old cat had kittens three what do you think their name should be 
Oh. Somebody mailed that back in the day. So this is the latest edition of my mom's cats on stamps collection, by the way. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. You know, I mean, my about... mom's collection. I'm buying it for my mom. <laughs> these cats in my office. <laughs> Sweet. This is a lot of fun. Thank you yeah. so much yeah. for joining us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Um, of course. See you soon. You Michael, I was actually, the way this came about, I was on the phone with, with Casey Jo White uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she mentioned conversations with philatelists. And I was like, why haven't we had you on yet? It's one yeah. of those ones, I've said this a couple of times, where it seems so obvious in retrospect mm-hmm. that this is somebody we need to have on here. Uh, but it took me talking to her about something completely unrelated to realize, like, let's make this happen. So this is one that, that I think is long overdue, but but uh, certainly one of the most enjoyable conversations uh, that I think we've had. Yeah, and, and that's how a lot of our guests come to us is we're just we're just talking to people we know and we just say, hey, hey, what if we recorded this? <laughs> yeah, what if we, well, that was the entire point. Right. Uh, exactly. that, it's meant to feel like a conversation. I don't. Uh, you know, I don't want to feel like we're interrogating somebody. I want it mm-hmm. to just be a conversation. The mm-hmm. conversations we've had hundreds of times at stamp shows or on the phone. Yeah. Um, except people have to look at us now. Yeah, sometimes. Unless they're listening unless to the they're on audio. podcast. Right. But so the, but this was great. I I really liked that she gave us kind of an inside look into how she researches material. The fact that she she uses old old newspapers, she uses old documentation old books you know she's got she's got that journalistic eye she's yeah. got that that writer you know what i mean that's mm-hmm. something that that you i think you sort of have or you don't have that's really hard to teach someone yeah. and the fact that she's coming at stamps with the reporters mm-hmm. the, the storytelling angle yeah i think is is what's really uh, really interesting and exciting yeah it, it's going to be a great she's going to do a great favor to the hobby by by coming in with such passion and such skill in researching material it, it's really going to provide us with something that we that we had in, in some other people and, and it's another well, addition i, to I the, think that every generation has yeah. those like just the, those writers whose name you can count on seeing every issue or two and you know that mm-hmm. it's always you know whether it's a pat hurst or a um you know george sloan or someone like that and i hope that casey is our generation's hurst or sloan yeah it, it definitely seems that way because i feel like the last in the last eight APs that I've read. She's been in there four times, five times so with different, all that kinds of different articles. So it's good it, batting average. It is. It is a tremendous batting average. Do you know anyone who's going to be in uh, an upcoming issue of the AP by any chance? Uh, no, 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 <laughs> no, no idea. No, what no, 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 I mean, I, I don't know when they're publishing that. So I can't. No, we can tease it. That's why, that's why I'm asking about it. Uh, this is all being left in. Michael uh, wrote a fantastic article for the American Philatelist on behalf of the uh, U.S. Philatelic Classic Society that uh, I won't mention what it is now because I do want to have a special episode, a mini episode where we talk about our recent cool. writings. Yeah. Um, but but uh, I will just just say that uh, you let me read it and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I can't wait to see that <laughs> let you read it. You helped me with a lot of the, you know, a, a lot of the especially the, the photographs. The, 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 the writing was all you and I, I so speaking of AP I can't wait for uh, for everyone listening to be able to read your contribution to that magazine well, thank you Charles that means a lot um, if you guys have the what was it the January or December issue of the AP that your article was in it was a while ago it was a while ago maybe November uh, um, you had an article about... it was less interesting than yours uh, I found it but, interesting I reread it I reread it to Aid with my yeah, article. To steal from it. <laughs> I you, you hit the control button and then control. The C. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I would love to do a little episode where we talk about what we've written recently, mm-hmm. and we've also been writing for Stamp Collector in the UK. We've been doing yeah. our monthly column where yeah. uh, people can can read about the episodes they may have listened to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If they're listening to this, odds are they will have heard the episodes we're writing about. But um, we're we're. We're trying to go with that old school social media as well, the the written work. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and if we can give a shout out to uh, Tammy Jackson as well. She she covered us in the American Stamp Collector and Dealer magazine where she, she wrote a lovely and incredibly kind article that, that did almost exactly what we're doing with Stamp Collector magazine where she reviewed all of the interviews that we'd had uh, since the start of the – it was like a three-page – it was fantastic. When, when I saw that, I was – 
blown away. This, yeah. uh, T- Tammy's uh, excitement and, and kindness for, for having written that for us. She's, yeah. uh, she's somebody we need to have on very soon. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was um, incredibly kind, too kind almost. Can I give one last shout out before we, uh, most likely before we go? Most likely. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to recount a little exchange. You, you already liked the tweets. So I like you, all your you, tweets. I was gonna say, you know where I'm going with this, but uh, I was looking actually on behalf of one of my colleagues, I was looking for a random auction catalog from the UK from 1988 mm-hmm. and um, Bill, I can tell people it's Bill because he was one of our guests. Oh, uh, Bill Yep. He went to the APRL to ask for it, and the APRL did not have it. So he said, you're a member of the Royal. Can you contact the RPSL library Mm -hmm. and see if they can maybe provide us with this auction catalog? And I thought, that is such a 20th century way (laughs) of approaching this problem. And I said this to Bill. I said, Bill, you're living in the 20th century still. He goes, well, what would you do? I said, I put it on Twitter. (laughs) He said, what do you mean? He goes, what did you put on Twitter? I said, hey, does anybody have... This uh, this Phillips of London auction catalog dated November third, nineteen eighty eight. I literally just tweeted that. It's <laughs> the most random tweet ever. Yeah. And within two hours, uh, HH Sales Limited, who coincidentally Bill has bought literature from on eBay before, they're a, a <laughs> wonderful literature dealer based out of the UK. Tweets me, "Is this the one you're looking for?" With the picture of the catalog, and I said, "Shockingly, that is the one I'm looking for." And then I told them the two lot numbers I needed, and they sent me images of the descriptions of those two lots so <laughs> this is why i'm so i'm sort of uh it's fantastic i was gonna say social media is a mixed bag i'll be honest yeah. there's some great things on twitter there's some horrible things on twitter <laughs> but the fact that i could just put this random tweet out there and have somebody in the uk see it and respond so quickly um i want to encourage everybody who's looking for any philatelic literature mm-hmm. to go to hh sales because they are incredibly clutch and incredibly kind uh, and, and just so helpful that uh, I was like just blown away. So, so if you're looking for a book, um, go buy something from HH Sales, please, because yeah. they are awesome and I love them and I can't thank them enough. I love the recount of the telling of the story there because I, I watched it unfold. You, 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 you liked <laughs> each tweet as it happened. You saw my initial tweet and then you saw, yeah. they just hit me with the, is this yeah. it? And I, I laughed like, out loud when that happened because it was just... <laughs> And I was so shocked. I drove back like, that's it. Because I didn't know what to make of the whole thing. So again, this yeah. is where social media um, is just so integral and, and key to, to the future of this hobby, I think. Whether you yeah. like it or not, um, it's, it's here to stay. And however we can utilize it, I, uh, I feel like I've got to you know, pass on this, this kind deed. Yeah. Like, I have to help somebody else with research now to, to pay it for it because <laughs> – I was just so amazed that they were like, they saw it and they were like, let me go find the catalog. It's, it's cool. Yeah. So I want to give them a shout out because that yeah. was a fun little, uh, something that happened this afternoon. No, that was a, uh, that was incredible. That was i uh, I'm glad they were able to find it for you. And, and, uh, it was very kind of them to do that. And I'm glad we could, uh, we have, we, we have a we cool, hobby. we have a really cool hobby. I've got to be honest. We do. Philately is, is really, really incredible. Yeah. Um, um I'm it's really little, th- it's little things like that, that remind you that like, these are just, we know a lot of a lot of really good people in this world. Yeah, a little a lot of good people that care about what they're doing and care about the hobby, and they they want to they want to make sure it's preserved for the future, and they want to give it the best future possible. So, it, I mean, it is it's a fantastic hobby with fantastic people, and absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, again, fun, fun little stories like that can only happen on Twitter these days, since we can't <laughs> since we can't uh, hang out with anybody in person. I'm, I'm yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, confined to interacting like that. But, uh, but yeah, again, Casey, Joe White. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a, a, an awesome interview. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, anybody listening to this uh, can also watch us on YouTube. Anybody watching us on YouTube can listen to us on Google Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can visit us at philatelypodcast.com. You can email us at philatelypodcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. I think, I think that's all the things. I think that's all I've got for this. Uh, yeah. for this one. Um, Michael, okay. this was a lot of fun. This I, I really enjoyed this. Yeah. Uh, until next time. Absolutely. I'll talk to you real soon.